All right, good morning. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we pray that you will be with us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to be in this place with us today. Uh, God, if we don't meet with you, all we've done is lose sleep today. God, we, we, we desire you. Uh, speak to us, and we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, highly encourage you to take notes today. Uh, you should have uh, a connection card near you, and so, of course, there's a detachable part that we would like for you to place in a basket and give to us later, but also uh, on the main section of that is a note section. There's some things that you will want to put on. Uh, I was just showing Pastor Dusty, I actually mess up and mislabeled some of my scriptures, so they are working to fix my mistake in the back. If initially the scriptures that I'm giving you are not on the screen, just, just give me a minute, totally my mistake. Uh, but I want to continue to talk about something we began to talk about uh, last week, and that is the idea that we are represented all through the Bible as stones. Uh, and, and, and the Bible has multiple ways to speak of stones, just as we do. Uh, we, we have pebbles, we have rocks, we have boulders, uh, and, and, and the same existed um, in the language that the Bible is written in. And so uh, there's this idea of a, a building block, a building stone. And all throughout Scripture, we are referred to as building stones, building one holy temple. And so this analogy really works on a global scale. You can look at it like, uh, you, you know, this is one church in the county. This is one church in the county. Or this is a church in uh, the United States, so on and so forth. And so uh, you could also put that on a more micro level and say that... Um, this is, this is one person in this congregation. This is one person in this congregation. So it, it really works. It's a very on-the-nose analogy, uh, and it's not mine. I didn't come up with this. This is just all scriptural. So uh, this is what we're looking at today, but I, I want to look today not really at the more macro level, but at the micro level of what, what God is, is, is telling us through this. It really works. And um, we started off last week. You guys know that um, uh, Nehemiah became the governor of, of Jerusalem, essentially. And, and, and he was released from captivity to come and help rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild uh, the wall that was around Jerusalem. A respectable city needed a respectable wall, and they had many enemies, and they were under great opposition. And so he got the people all pumped up, and everybody has their own task, okay? Now we're going to sort of back up and get a description of how it went building the wall, because some of you are in that phase of life. Maybe you're building the wall, or maybe, just maybe, somebody pushed over some blocks in your wall, and you have some wall mending to do. And so I think that most of us uh, walked into this place today, and this is a really theological term, but most of you, maybe you didn't say it this way, but you say, my wall sucks. Uh, you, that's what they teach you in seminary, okay? But maybe, maybe you walked in and you were like, listen, my wall is in shambles. I need a mason. We got you. Hang on. Want to take notes. Okay, I am in Nehemiah today, Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, verse 4. And this is for anyone wanting to build their wall. Anyone wanting to pick up the pieces and put them back in order for the first time or again. Listen, for the first time or again. Nobody walked into this place perfect. Not a, lot of, not a lot of people walking in this door, a Bible scholar. We did not expect that. We understand that. That's why we at least try to get the Scripture on it. You already got it. You're so good. Y'all look back there. Look at that. Look at that. She's not just another smiling face. Man. Okay. So, uh, Shelby got me all distracted. Here we go. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 4. Listen, our God... For we are despised. This is the people crying out to God because they're under opposition. I'm trying to put my stuff back together, and, 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 and here we go. Listen, our God, for we are despised. Make their insults return on their heads, and let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight, because they have angered 
the builders. You're like, dude, I wasn't here last week. I have no idea what you're talking about. Jerusalem is trying to build the wall, and the people around them don't like it. Just like they don't like it when you try to build your walls. Okay? Because rather than build my walls to match yours, it's just easier to knock yours down. And so you're jumping into this story, and well, who's the bad guy? Who's it? it doesn't matter because you know him. I'm going to tell you the dude's name that's spearheading all the opposition. His name is Sambalot. And if you were here last week, you know that you don't know Sambalot, but you know Sambalot. Because Sambalot's the one who wants to tear down your wall. And as soon as I start putting stuff back together, he comes over. It's like, I've been clean. Here comes Sambalot, and he's got a crack pipe. I've been doing good. Here comes Sambalot, and he wants to go out tonight. I've been, I've been doing well and getting my family back together, and here comes Sambalot, and he looking handsome. He's going to sweep me off my feet. You know what I'm saying? You know Sambalot. And it may not, it may not be something uh, as nefarious as that, but it's just anything to, to get you out of building your wall. And this is what God wants. He wants us to put things in order, Okay. So, the people began. Here we go. We're building the wall. And so what do we do first? We go and grab bricks and we start mixing mortar? No, they prayed. I need you to write that down. They prayed because they understood that the enemy was greater than them. Church, I need you to understand that the enemy is greater than you. Listen, all the way back in Genesis... Maybe you've heard of Moses and the people in captivity and Pharaoh's going to let the people out. And, and, and God tells, tells Moses, I'll tell you what I'll do. You take your staff, you take your stick, and you go in and throw your stick down, and it's going to become a snake. Like, that's a party trick right there. If one of you comes up here right now and throws a stick down and it becomes a snake, I'm like, I'm listening. But you know what happened? The magicians threw down a couple sticks, and both of those sticks became a snake as well. Now, if that happens, I'm out. You've got it. You've got the building. <laughs> I'm out. That's weird. From what power did they do this? Understand that you can't make sticks turn into snakes. You don't have the kind of power that your enemy has. But then, Moses' snake ate the other snakes. Talk about some on-the-nose symbolism. And God is more powerful than your enemies, but you are not more powerful than your enemies. So to defeat your enemies, you need. Some of y'all said prayer, some of you said God, and you all got it right. All right, so we got to start with prayer. Let's go to verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had the will to keep working. This is interesting. This is interesting. And this is, this is really why we're teaching out of this today. But this really resonated with me today. And there's a reason that I'm able to be so high. I have some more. Dusty, Pastor Dusty, and he's, he's exactly right. He says, don't make all of your props too complicated. It takes away from the message. I know I already have a wall, but I have a wall behind a wall just because I wanted this to work better. Okay. So forgive me, but I've got a bit of a wall coming up here. You can see this. Does that bother any of you that it's not the same height? This works. This is working for me, okay? And I only got two hands, so there's not, I can't put up one behind me. But now, with this wall, I'm only partially protected. Because you still get a headshot on me, <laughs> right? I'm only partially protected. Now, As they're building the wall, they only have so much manpower. And the question is, do we all jump on this section and get it full height? And then we move over to this section and get it full height. And then we move over in full height. And then we move over to this section, full height, and then we've got the wall. What was the problem with that plan? The problem is, if one of my walls is down, I'm exposed. And so they decided that it would be better to have walls that were halfway tall than to have a gap. Does that make sense? Because now I'm fully exposed. Even if this, even if this is, if if, if this is all the way. (laughs) Thank you. I'm still exposed. 
I'm still exposed. Even if one side is all the way, I'm still exposed. And so I think spiritually, the question becomes this, do you have gaps in your wall? Pastor, what do you mean by that? I'm glad you asked. We teach that if you want to get closer to God, that there are four things that you can do that will bring you closer to God. And that is, read your Bible, pray, go to church, and be the church. Okay? Read your Bible, pray, go to church, and be the church. Imagine that as your four walls for a moment. And you say, oh, pastor, I love to pray. I love to pray. But I ain't into that reading. You got a wall down. You know what you have? You have a... a Thanks, Belinda. You have a one-way walkie-talkie. And you can push the button and you can talk, but you can't hear nobody talk back. How would you like to go into battle with that? Guys, are you in position? Over. I guess we're going in. (laughs) I don't know. If you've got a wall down, and so... What they did is decide, you know what, rather than work on everything being perfect, you need to hear me today. Rather than work on everything being perfect, I need to just start with what I got and I need to start filling in the gaps because Satan has a run and start at me. Because Satan has a run and start at me. There's no wall. There's no opposition. If I have half walls, at least I can fight the ones trying to come over because it's going to slow them down. And so you, I, I, I ask you, and I'm going to give you a generic conversation, but I ask you, are you a follower of Jesus? Man, yes, yes. And what we mean is, I got three walls, <laughs> You love the Lord? Are you a Christian? I love the Lord. I'm a Christian. But Satan's got a straight heart shot at me. I've got to get my walls up. I'm starting to read. I'm starting to pray. But my phone has got me. Put some protection on it. I'm getting this under control. But I got somebody that I work with and they're trying to get to me. You've got to get a wall. Well, I can't get rid of my job right now because I, how about a half wall? How about we slow them down? How about we start working on these things so that nobody's got straight runs at me? The enemy is trying to get in lust, laziness, lack of understanding, lack of faith. Satan in general is trying to get in. And if you don't have your walls up, better a half wall than no wall. And better four halves than three big walls and a huge gap. Hopefully the Holy Spirit is just speaking to you because I can't go through every scenario of what it might be to have a gap in your wall. But church, man, you're smart. You know. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We say that. Let me rephrase it this way. If if you were to call me and say, Pastor, don't hang up. I've only got one phone call. (laughs) You and the Huskow, baby. You there. Now, why? Why are you there? And we would all say, well, it's probably, and then blah, you've got something different. Okay, boom, there you go. There you go. You don't, you, you don't even have a half wall against anger. You don't even have a half wall against lust. And so, you know, you know why you would be making that call. It, the situation hasn't even happened, but you would say, ah, pretty much here's what it's going to be. Right? They decided to be better To fill in the gaps, then to finish section at a time. Interesting. When we have no blocks on our phone, when we have no accountability from anyone in the church, when we have no church family, no one to help us, we isolate ourselves, we're just making gaps. We're making gaps. Come on, you know about fences. Go buy yourself a brand new, brand new herd of cattle, and you put them in a great pen with three fences. 
Verse 7. When Sambalot, Tobiah, and the Arabs, Ammonites, and Ashdodites heard that the repair to the walls of Jerusalem was progressing and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. Of course they did. But wait, if you know the story the whole time, they weren't trying to hurt nobody. They're peaceful, but yet they're ticked when the wall goes up. Well, if you mean me no harm, why are you mad that I am now in a defensible position? Hold on. They became furious. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw it into confusion. Based upon what? We're going to fight them. Why? They've been there all this time. Waves and waves of Jews are coming back into their homeland. And as long as the walls are down, church, you've got to extrapolate to yourself. As long as the walls are down, no one has a problem with it. But when all of a sudden I can't get to them any time I want to get to them, I've got to defeat them. Are you trying to build your wall? You go brick by brick and it's real cute. Oh, I'm good for you. Good for you. I'm proud for you. But you start closing in gaps and you find out who your enemies are. You start putting things together when your life is no longer in shambles, when you are following the teachings of Jesus and it is elevating you to a higher place. All of a sudden, somebody who always had your best interest in mind shows that they always had their best interest in mind. Because you're filling in the gaps. And I can't get to you anytime I want to get to you. It's not cute anymore. It's not, oh, good for you, you found religion anymore. It's, I have no more access to you. You're going to church, that's cute. That's one wall, I can easily walk around it. I caught you praying, I'll go around Helping somebody out, being the church, being the hands and feet of Jesus, good for you. As long as the wall is down, I can still get to you. And now you're telling me about what you read in the Bible? Boom, opposition. Because now you're off limits to the enemy, so they're mad. So before you can fill in that last gap, you better know Satan is coming full steam. I had a friend in college who had a pornography addiction. And he said, I've given it to the Lord. It came back next week, and I said, how's it going? Now, keep in mind, when I was in college, and it wasn't that long ago, and anybody who says otherwise, (laughs) I'll baptize you today. (laughs) Until the bubbles come up. It wasn't that long ago. I said, how's it going, man? And he said, you never believe it. He said, in my mailbox this week, I got two Playboy subscriptions sent to the wrong address. It's never happened to me in my life. They're literally, it's the wrong address with a different person's name, different people on both one, and I got two of them. I had the strength to throw one of them away, and then I got another one. That's because he's filling in the last gap. And the enemy said, ooh, we're not going to be able to get to him long. Let's make a run at it. You think he was strong enough? Do you think you're strong enough? Bring me a stick, throw it down, and let it become a snake, and then we'll decide you're strong enough. You need help. You need the Lord. That's why we start with prayer. That's why we start with prayer. And then we build the wall. We may not have it all perfect yet. I'm reading, Pastor. I don't get a lot of it. I'm not a Bible scholar. That's why we're having class tonight. I want to teach you to fall in love with the Bible. That's why we're having this. Your wall's not all the way up yet. But you can fill in gaps. Yeah. 
Satan's mad when he can't get to you. The last gap's going to get blown up. All of a sudden, the people are mad who never meant you any harm, but apparently they did because they're angry that you're no longer accessible because they know that they can't take advantage of you any longer. Christ wants to liberate you from your enemies, and that's why you have a wall, not to keep people out, but to protect the people who come in. Listen to verse 9 through 11. So we pray to our God and stationed a guard because of them day and night. They stationed a guard in the gaps. Come on. You got gaps? Get a guard. Somebody better know about it. I haven't met a man who overcame an addiction yet who didn't confess the addiction. And I'm not just talking about substance. I don't know anyone who has overcome habitual sin yet who did not confess it. You need someone on your side. As I read the Bible, I am more and more convinced. It is overwhelming how much God has shown us, I'm going to do my work, but I'm going to do it through you. And so you need to play the role of the most important person in someone's life this week, holding them accountable, standing guard in their gaps. That's what I was able to do for my friend. How did it go this week? And he says, I got two subscriptions. Where are they? They're in my room. Let's go throw them away, <laughs> okay? I need a guard in the gaps. I, I have no idea where we are. Verse 10, is that right? In Judah, it was said, the strength of the laborer fell since there is so much rubble. We will never be able to rebuild the wall. Have you ever looked at your life and been like, man, this... I can't, th there's not enough time in my life to pick up all these pieces. There is just not enough time. And our enemy said they won't realize it until we're among them and can kill them and stop the work. Morale got low. Morale got low. And the builders were depressed at how much rubble they had to weed through. And they kind of lost their spunk, maybe just for a minute. And if you've been there, we get it. And that is why you have a church. This is why you have a family. This is why more than one family, more than one clan, more than one people section was working on the wall. This is why it's not just the Woodbridge Church that is working on the city. We pray for our, our, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Jesus who are in different churches this morning who are building on the same wall. We support you. We love you. We encourage you. It's one wall. Because it can be depressing to look around and say, there's so much rubble. There's so many pieces that are falling down. No, there's not. Because I know last week you said everything was going wrong, and that's because you had one hot check and you had a flat tire. That's not everything. Take a little trip up to Cook Children's with me. Okay? Your flat tire, not that big of a deal. It makes for a bad day, and I get it. But it ain't everything. There's not that much rubble on the ground. You say, my life is in complete shambles. Somebody's been intervening all along just for such a time as this. There's not a wall yet that's not mendable. The whole wall's been knocked down. Good. You don't have to go very far to get your blocks. You get to build it back as strong as you want it. Not as bad as you think it is. Piece by piece, clan by clan, they close the gaps. Aim to build every day. Aim to build every day. Church, you need to write this down. Aim to build every day. I'm just working on a half wall right now. That's fine. That's fine. 
Don't be satisfied once you get there. But for right now, that's fine. But aim to build every day. What you struggling with? You got rage problems? You got lust problems? You got self-control problems? Aim to build every day. Start filling in those gaps. Block at a time. It's not so far that you can't fill in those gaps. Verse 12, when the Jews who lived nearby arrived, they said to us time and time again, everywhere you turn, they attack us. What do you mean when the Jews who lived nearby arrived? Because it became so bad that their brothers and sisters who lived outside of the wall had to come in for shelter. Why? Because now there's shelter. They lived outside of the walls because the walls never mattered before. And now the walls are doing something. And some of you have lived in a world, in a culture that valued church, but they never seen the church actually do anything before. And now all of a sudden, well, these jokers are, it's safer in there. And so the walls were built not to keep their brothers and sisters out, but to invite them in for protection. This is not a place where you get to be pious or snobby. If you are that, you are definitely welcome here, but you don't get it yet. Because that's not what Jesus did. He went out, and he, like, like tax collectors were traitors to their people. They actually robbed their own people to pay the Romans. And Jesus is at tables full of them. This is the most hated people. In fact, they were below prostitutes. He went to prostitutes and tax collectors, and everybody had a problem with the tax collectors. And they're like, yeah, you're going to be a religious leader, and you're doing this. He said, I'm building wells, and they need protection. Church, I know it's a little bit crowded in here. A couple weeks, and we'll have so much room, so much room. We're going to move over to college. We'll have so much room. Okay. Meanwhile, this is going to be expanded, and we'll have plenty of seats for everybody. So thank you for hanging in there with us. But why are we doing that? I'm going to tell you right now, this is just a building. If it burns down today, you're still the church. If it becomes illegal to meet in a big congregation like this, that's okay. you got a living room, and somebody here knows you, invite them over and go through the Scripture just like we're doing right now. But why are we doing this? Why are we? I hate spending money on things. Okay? Because since we've been here, we've done a lot of stuff in the community. And y'all know that. We're really community-driven. The community is having a party. We're there. We got our hats on. <laughs> We're expanding because we have brothers and sisters that we love that need to be inside of those walls because we have an enemy that's greater than us. And so we extend an invitation and an open hand. Piety has no place in this wall. Arrogance has no, no place. If you were, dude, if you're arrogant, <laughs> like, do you, you haven't drawn a breath yet that God didn't allow you to do. Like, so, so, so tell me, I, hey, you worked hard to get where you're at? Awesome. You know why you were able to work hard? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Be proud of yourself. Absolutely. Arrogant, no place in the Christian life. This is why we're expanding the sanctuary. For numbers, listen, dude, if we're after numbers, Ranger ain't the place to start a church. It's just not a big city. No, we're after the people that we love. Verse 13 and 14. After I made an inspection, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord and fight, your con fight for your countrymen, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. He says, don't fear the enemy. Fear losing your family. Why do you want to build a wall? Come on, dude. You don't have anybody worth protecting? You don't have anyone in your life that you would like to be a refuge for? Don't fear the enemy. Fear losing the ones that you love. That's your drive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this quite a bit, but I got to give you, Dusty gave me this this week, and I thought it was gold. 
thought it was absolute gold. He said, when you worry, you're putting more faith in the enemy than you are in God. So I'm not worried about facing my enemy. I'm worried about facing God telling him that I wouldn't face my enemy. That was good. Dusty, mine might have been better than yours. Whatever that I said at the end, write it down. I don't know. <laughs> when our enemies heard that we knew their scheme and that God had frustrated every one of us, return to his own work on the wall. When they knew that we had frustrated their schemes and we put guards in the wall, because I had to take men off of duty. I had to take women off of duty. I had to take somebody off of building the wall to guard the wall. I had to get off of offense to get on defense. And sometimes it is necessary to get off of offense and onto defense. You say, you know what? There's some places at this time in my life I just can't go there. I just can't be there. I'm so far from y'all. I'm going to be up here. You say, I can't go there right now. I can't be there right now. It's just too much for me. I can't handle this temptation. And you need to draw away and you need to play defense. And I get it. But church, as you can, be on offense. Jesus said, you are my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome you. Think about that. Ain't nobody running into battle against you with a gate. The fact that it, the Bible says that the gates of hell won't overcome you doesn't mean that somebody's trying to attack you with a gate. That's not the way gates work. That means that you're storming the gates. That's offense. We've got to be on offense. You've got to take time to play defense. I understand and do it. I'm just, I don't know. I just don't know anymore. Matthew 28, 18 says this, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the ends of the age. We're supposed to build a wall, but then we're supposed to go. This wall goes with you everywhere that you go. You understand that this wall is spiritual. And I put these things up around me, and I can go to Taiwan, I can go to Australia, I can be in Texas, and I have the walls around me because I have the power of the Holy Spirit because I am in the kingdom of God. And there are walls around that kingdom that we are building spiritually, and I am not called to stay on defense. I am not called to hide inside of the walls. I am called to take the walls out, I know that's weird, and provide refuge for people who want to come to Jesus. Okay? This is what I do with my walls. It's not for me to hide behind. It's not for me to say, well, we're safe, thank God, and they can go to hell. No. I am to take this. I am to take the kingdom and provide these spiritual walls so that they can provide for someone else. You're made to go, literally, made by God to go. I got to hurry. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half held spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers supported all the people of Judah who were rebuilding the wall. I love this part. I love this part. I got to get off of this Ricky you thing. This is just this, this is a disaster. Dusty, you were right. <laughs> the laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and held a weapon with the other. Man, they laid block with a weapon in one hand, laying block with the other. There's so much spiritual significance. Let me finish this. Let me finish this. Each of the builders had his sword strapped around his waist while he was building. And the one who surrounded the ram's horn was beside me. Uh, sounded the ram's horn was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is enormous and spread out, and we are separated far from one another along the wall. What does that mean? What's the ram's horn for? Because when one experiences an attack, the ram horn who's in the middle, and he alerts the believers, and they're ready. Why? Because they never dropped their sword. Understand that if you go into Ephesians, I believe it's Ephesians chapter 6, you will learn about the armor of God. And you have the sandals, uh, you, have, you have sandals, breastplate, helmet, and it's, it's salvation, righteousness, and you have a shield of faith, and you have all of these things. But understand that those are all defensive. You have one offensive weapon. You have one weapon that it takes to take it to the enemy, and that is the sword. And do you know what the sword always represents? 
That's the Word of God. You have the Word of God. Do you understand that when Jesus went into the temptation, uh, in, into, into temptation in the des- desert, he, w- he was fasting and Satan came. And Satan, before Jesus starts his ministry, because he doesn't start his ministry until after this, Satan comes to him and he brings his best game. And he says, Satan, Satan knows he's hungry. And so he's like, hey, listen, if you're the Son of God, turn this bread, uh, turn this rock into bread, which proves that carbs are from Satan. So, uh, <laughs> So Jesus goes through all this, and, and he asks him to prove himself. And do you know what Jesus does? He quotes Scripture. Why? Because he never was without his sword. He was hungry. He was praying. And he never was without his sword. He needed the Word of God because he knew that he was fighting someone stronger than him. And he pulls out Excalibur. He gets the Word of God and says, No. And that's the only way he can overcome it. Because although he's fully God, he was fully human. And he dealt with every temptation that we deal with. And Satan was no joke when he was offering the big stuff. He brought his best offer to the table. He said, listen, I'll give you the Cowboys and I- Josh Allen can be quarterback. And then it went. Some of y'all are not. Okay. He was given his best offers, and Jesus never dropped his sword. When Sambalot, I mean, I, I, I'm going I'm I'm to skip to uh, chapter 6 right now. Next week, we're going to go back to chapter 5. There's a reason that I skipped it, but listen. When Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it, <laughs> what do you think they're going to do now? Now, are they going to stop? No, they're going to stop trying to fight because they know they can't get in. But we're just going to try a different tactic. Though at the time, I had not installed the doors in, in the city gates. Sambalot of Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. Now, what's important to you is not that the Ono Valley, that you know where it is on the map. What's important to you is that you know that Ono Valley is not in the walls. And Sambalot says, hey, Come in peace, man. Come on. You ever get in a you ever get in a little bit of a traffic violation and somebody knocks on your window and says, Get out, I just want to talk? They don't want to talk. Don't fall for it. They were planning to harm me. So I sent messages messages to them saying, listen, because I, I, you, you, you need to write down Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3, because this is brilliant. He said, I am doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the proposal, and I gave them the same reply. They can't get to me anymore, so we start trying to negotiate. Here's the problem with negotiations. Uh, negotiations don't sound quite like we think they do. Because we think that a negotiation with Satan says, Hey, I'll give you a good bajillion dollars if you'll sell your soul to me. And that's not what it sounds like. That's not, uh, do you all know that yet? That's not how Satan negotiates. Because he doesn't have to spend that much because we are so much cheaper. And so he's like, you're in the way? I'll just, spend you, I'll just send you this dirty spam text message. That'll get you out of the way for a little bit. I can't get to you, but I can get to this dude at work who crawls under your skin. And you don't have all your walls up yet. Or at least they're halfway, and that'll get you out of the way for a little while. Can't get to you, but I can get to your car, and you can't afford those repairs right now. And we're so much cheaper than what we ever think this negotiation is going to look like. And his reply is brilliant. Why should I stop progress? I'm on offense. Of course you want me to come down because I'm effective. Church, it is your greatest life's compliment. And I say this 
with a, I don't know what else to, how else to be. I say it with a smile because it's really, really sad. One of the greatest compliments that you can get is to be worth Satan's time. I know that's what we fear the most. But do you understand one of the greatest compliments that you can receive in your life is that you were so effective and so dangerous that you had to be taken out. One of the greatest life compliments that you will receive is that Satan sees you as a threat. But it's also the scariest thing because you haven't had an enemy until you have this one. He's relentless. Does not go by the Geneva Convention. Your children are not off limits to him. Sick, weak, elderly, not off limits to him. He is a detestable character. And you put a target on your back. I'd be honored to have it. Because you have been used by God and you're a threat. Well, that's not a very good selling point, preacher. Did you not hear that now you have all those people in a wall? This is why we build our wall. Sambalot is going to go on to accuse. He's actually going to sue them. <laughs> Some of y'all, that's way too personal. Sambalot's going to go on to sue the Jews. But God has her back. As long as they follow the Lord... They have their walls that they've built. God is bringing them protection. Church, if you have a gap in your walls, go ahead, Jake, come on. If you have a gap in your walls, God is calling you to something else. And, and again, this is my thing. We do not preach out of, out of condemnation or piety. I do this to, to save you from frustration. If you say, I've been living this this church thing, I've been trying to follow Jesus, and I'm just not getting all that you're thinking that I'm supposed to get out of this. Let me ask you this question. Do you still have gaps in your walls? The Lord is calling us to close that. The Lord is calling us to fill that. And he will help. Case in point. Now, you're being baptized today, right? Do you understand that within a very short while, she's not the only one in her household to be baptized? See, Dad comes in and starts to mend those walls and build those walls. And she says, I want in there. So I'm going to ask you in front of your church family, Have you accepted Jesus as Lord? And Lord means like boss, okay? You're dying to yourself right now. That's what you're going to do. Uh, buried with him in death. That means just in the way Jesus died, you're dead. You're done. Jade, who's in charge of, charge of Jade, is done. Dunsky. And then you raise back in a new life where Jesus is in charge of Jade, right? That's what I mean by Lord and Savior. Savior means when I die, I'm going to him with heaven. Have you accepted Jesus as both of those, as Lord and Savior? Okay, you guys hear that? So, awesome. Go ahead and take a seat right there. Jesus was in the tomb for three days, so I'm holding her for three seconds, okay? I want you to picture this is your death. You're coming back as someone new. This is a great symbolism, and also, spiritually, it's a bath. So, we're working with multiple symbols here. But let me see your arm right here. Okay, it is my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death. Raised to walk in the newness of life in Jesus. Proud of you, girl. Ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. That's why you build those walls right there. So listen. That's what a church is for, man. We want to help you with this. If, you've, if you're going through something, we want to walk with you as best we can. We know it's personal. We know nobody, there's, Jesus 
it, the Holy Spirit's here this morning, but like in the flesh, Jesus ain't here. Ain't none of y'all Jesus, okay? So nobody's that, but God works through his people supernaturally, and we want to walk with you best that we can. So you have, uh, you have a connection card. We'd love for you to fill that out. Put that in the offering basket as it comes up, because these, these, these uh, them, they're going to play music right now. And uh, baskets are up, so put that connection card in. But also, uh, if, if you're a Christian, part of the way that we worship is through tithe and offering. It's an appropriate place to, to put that as well. Better yet, when service is over, we have some people who are going to come up. If you're on the prayer team, won't you actually come up today around this baptistry? You'll know them because they're up here touching the baptistry. Uh, they're going to come up. They want to pray with you, so we would love to do that uh, for you. So that's best case scenario. Otherwise, man, just put it in that connection card, drop it in the basket. But we want you to build your what You are the church, and we are here to cheerlead you on as you put your walls together. We're rooting for you because we've all, this, this is all of us. So we're rooting for you as we work on it ourselves. All right? Please stand and worship with us.